Oh wait, no, I'm not. Hold on. Okay, so I want to dedicate this song first to Amber, who would be my cousin and law, I guess. Yeah. Um, she asked me to sing this song because her and her grandma used to sing this song. And I know that her grandma is very proud of her and looking down on her right now, and I'm also very proud of her. Um, I'm also very proud of my cousin Timothy and my aunt Mel. Now. Um, let's just say it's been something we've prayed for for a long time to see them come to salvation. And so. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the
and security for all of eternity. But we don't do that. Why? Why? Well, several things. Number one, we see today that those who do that, they ignore repeated warnings. They ignore repeated warnings. Those who die in their sins then and those who die in their sins now and go to a devil's hell, that is the ultimate place of those who die in their sins, they go to a devil's hell, do not go without warning, church. They don't go without warning. Pleasure-seeking king Belshazzar, uh, the Babylonian king, did not go to hell without a warning. He was warned by David and died that very night at the hand of the Persians. That very night, David told him, you're going to die tonight. And he did not seek safety in the Lord. He did not seek the place that he needed to be. No, he stuck the course and he ended up dying that very night at the hand of the Persians and now resides in hell forever. The Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he knew Jesus was innocent. He knew Jesus Christ was innocent that day. He knew it. And yet his pride and hearing that mobbish throng of people yelling and screaming and calling him a great emperor and this and that one thing and another, a great governor. And his pride got in the way. He knew Jesus was innocent. And yet he straddled the fence. He straddled the fence. Let me tell you about it. If you're sitting on the fence today, you're trying to dabble in one world when you know you ought to be in the other. Let me tell you something about the fence. The Satan that owns the fence. And if you're sitting on the fence, you belong to him. Simple as that. You cannot have it both ways. I can tell you right now today that Thomas Pilate, Thomas Pilate did not go to hell without a warning. He caved into the sinful Jewish leadership. He didn't go to hell without a warning. His own very own wife, Claudia, in Matthew 27 and verse 19, she said, his wife said, have nothing to do with this man. And yet he turned him over to that crowd and he could have set him free. You see, he went to hell with a warning. In Luke chapter 12, you read of the rich young fool who had a great harvest. That God had given him a greater harvest than his barns could hold. So rather than doing and honoring God and sharing his harvest, he turned all of the others down. So said, I'll build bigger ones and I can just rest in my leisure and just do one thing or another. I can just bask in the glory of all these riches that I've got. And yet the Bible says, Jesus said, food, tonight, your soul will be required of you. Died that very night, lost, and in hell today. Too many times, church, many times today, we're warned, warned over and over and over today, and they brush off the warnings. We brush off the warnings that are there, and we move on past it, and we pass on anyhow. They ignore the warnings of God and continue to chase after sin as if it is the only choice that they have. Let me ask you something, church. I'm not a man of many words. I'll say a lot in a little bit, but I'm going to tell you this much. I'm not a man that mentions words. I'm here today. I don't know what you're dabbling in today, but if you're doing it something and you know you ought to be in something else, you might want to take heed to what these youngsters have went through right here. They're all in hell today, but they continue to follow man's way and not God's way. Now, I don't know what you're dabbling in. I don't know what you got your hands in. I don't know what you're slipping around and doing. But I do know this. I know the outcome of it. You know the thing that gets me more than anything else, church? People will stop at the bridge outside. Oh no, the bridge is out. We can't go this way. They'll turn at the danger ahead detour. They'll turn and take the detour. But yet when God comes to them, they shun him away. The very one that could have kept Belshazzar out of hell. The very one who could have kept Thomas Pilate out of hell. The very one who could have kept the rich young ruler out of hell. And they turned him away. Let me ask you this. What are you turning away today? Secondly, we see that those who pass on, they ignore the Spirit's calling. They ignore the Spirit's calling, the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible plainly teaches, church, that
that the Holy Spirit of God speaks to the very heart of man. How do I know that? Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door of your heart today and he's knocking upon that door. And many times he probably stood at the door of your heart and he's probably knocked upon it. The Holy Spirit knocks in the heart of man each and every day and yet it is it's ignored. He may be knocking on the heart of some here today. He may just be nudging you. I don't know what's going on in your life. I do know this. I know what's happening in my life. I know that when I die, my last breath on this earth, my next breath is in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that, sir. And that is a free gift to all who receive it. So many today, so many today pass on. They push away the sweet, wonderful work of the Holy Spirit who's knocking on the heart. He's telling you, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to turn that seat loose, you need to do this, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, yet they resist that because of pride, fear, or whatever it may be. They reject and they deny that which they need the most. And for your soul's sake, church, I beg of you today, do not resist the voice of the Holy Spirit if He's knocking upon your heart today. Do not resist that that is happening in your life right now. Remember, church, what the scripture says. It says that the sinful pass on and are destroyed. The sinful pass on and are punished. Well, nobody wants to be known as simple, right? Then why would you even consider ignoring that which you know is right? Thirdly, we see today that those who are passing on they ignore the crying of God's people. The crying of God's people. The Apostle Paul prayed for his lost relatives and friends. Don't you remember something about Paul? Paul was named Saul. Saul was a died in the wool, full-fledged Pharisee amongst Pharisees. He was the leader of Pharisees. In other words, he was as Jewish as he could get. He followed the, the law to, to the very dot. Even to the persecution of Christians. Dragging them out of homes. Having them killed. Having them whipped. Having them thrown into jail. Riding from place to place. Ultimately he was riding on the Damascus Road. Going to capture some more Christians. Short version. He got knocked off the horse. The light shone down on him. Uh, he was blinded. He went into town. He had to live with a guy he didn't know for three days while he was blind. And he ultimately. God sent. Uh, a young man. To tell him. What he needed to do. And Paul put off Saul. He no longer was Saul, but now he is Paul. And he became the greatest apostle that the Lord Jesus Christ has ever known. What did he do? Now remember something. He was Jewish. He gave that up. He became a Christian. And the greatest apostle, he wrote most of the New Testament. And his family completely abandoned him. He was rich. Now he's poor. He was supported. Now he's not. He had friends. Now he doesn't. But yet he did it all for the cause of Christ because he knew it was what he needed to do. He prayed, but yet he prayed for his lost relatives and he prayed for his lost friends. Romans chapter 10 verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. And that is his prayer for you today. That is my prayer for you today. We have all witnessed, church, every one of us Every one of us has had a mama, a daddy, a grandmama. Or if you're not from this neck of the woods, a grandmother. We've all had them. That on broken knees, bent knees, they prayed for us because they knew we were in something we were supposed to be in. They knew we were out there in a lost world. And yet they continued to pray for us. And Paul's heart's desire was that they would be saved. And your mom, your dad, your grandparents, everybody desire for you. They've been crying and weeping for their loved one, the, you, the one that they love. You see, God sees the tears of His people, church. He sees the tears of His people. And He never forgets a single tear that has been shed. And those of you who are here today that have shed tears for your kids, brothers, uncles, aunts, and everybody else that you've cried for. Here's what God says. Psalm 56 and verse 8. You know from my wandering. 
You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Church, and for those of you who are lost here today, and you know who you are, the book we're talking about right here is Lamb for the Life. And I'm here to ask you right now, if you're here today, and you can't tell me with absolute certainty that your name is written in the Lamb for the Life, that you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that one day when you stand before God, but the Bible also tells us it is appointed a man wants to die, and then the judgment, we will all stand before God one day. And if you're not prepared for that, then I beg you, I plead with you, that you get that right today. Eternity is a long time. I can't measure it on that. I went to Miss Sherry, who's the best mathematician I know. She teaches eighth grade math. She can do that. She can teach me anything. She couldn't tell me how long eternity was. I think eternity is something that the Bible says as far as the east is from the west. I don't know how to measure that either. But I can tell you this. It's a long time. It's a long time to be in the place that the Bible describes when you can be in the beauty of heaven. Church, where are you? It's silly. It is absolutely silly to walk over the tears of your loved ones. Think about your grandmother who cried endless tears for you, sat by her bedside and weep, prayed for you in that bed down the low lake in knees, right on that bedside, praying, calling out to God in your name. Isn't it a sin? Isn't it a sin to ignore that? It's silly to ignore the tears of our loved ones. Passing over the tears, passing over the prayers, passing on over the pleading, passing on over the broken heart. Passing on over the faithful love and passing on over the devotion of those who have held your soul precious, church. Why do you do that? To cast aside the pleading of a mother or a grandmother to run and to wallow in the next pit of sin. Do you not hear? Do you not hear it? Are you listening? Do you not hear right now in that faint memory the wailing of those hearts, the crying of those parents? The crying of that grandparent as they pleaded before God for you. Do you not hear it, church? My memory can't be that bad that I cannot hear that pleading. Do you hear it? Do you not hear the crying of those who loved you? Those that have worn their knees out for your very soul today. And lastly today, those that pass on, the simple that pass on, they ignore the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says this. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us are being saved into the power of God. The cross, church, let me tell you something. The cross cannot be ignored. It must be reckoned with. To see, they see and they hear the cross, but yet they pass on, church. The cross means much to God. It means much to Him. It is the theme, church, of all of heaven's music. It is the power of all gospel preaching. And the cross is the only hope for mankind in this lost world. The only hope. It's the only safe refuge from God's wrath and from God's judgment. Don't pass on. Don't pass on. Don't pass it, pass it today. Do not pass that cross today without coming to the Lord Jesus Christ under salvation and repentance and salvation. Don't pass it. You know where you stand with the Lord. You know. I can tell you right now, there wasn't a day in my life that I didn't know I was. Anybody tell me I don't know, I think they're lying. Simple as that. I know what's right and what's wrong. So do you. Evangelist and preacher D.L. Moody 
great man of God, led some of the great revivals across this world. He said this way. This is his words. He only is safe for eternity. He only is safe for eternity who is sheltered behind the finished work of Christ. He only is safe for eternity who is sheltered behind the finished work of Christ. Let me tell you something. Let me ask you something, church. Are you safe in Christ today? Are you safe in Him today? I heard this morning of a gentleman who thought he'd have all night only to be unplugged from the machine that was keeping him alive. Really good man. I made mean, Good man. But yet, his life It's exactly like all of our lives held in the palm of God's hand. I ask, are you absolutely sure with absolute certainty today, if you die today, that you're going to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus? I'm not talking about I hope so. I'm not saying I might, maybe I will. It might happen. It could happen. No, I'm not talking about that because if you're thinking all those kind of things right now, I can tell you you're not. You're lost. And hell is your future. The Bible tells us we will appear one of two places. We will appear, if we're saved, we will appear before the being of seat of God. We will see the being of seat of Christ. We will appear before Jesus Christ to atone for all the things. But because of His blood that was spilled for us and our acceptance of Him as Lord and Savior, he will welcome us, welcome us into his heaven. Amen. But on the other side of the coin is this. Those who are not saved will appear in Roman, uh, excuse me, uh, Revelation 20. They will appear before the great white throne judgment of God. Where they will also atone for the things that they have done. And they will have no salvation in Christ. They will have no one to step up and say, that one's mine, and I died for him. They will have no one. And God will say, depart from me, because I never knew you. Now today I ask you, I'm not going to keep you long. Go hungry, just like me. But something more important. And the most important thing to me today is that there's no one here today that leaves this place that, that does not have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ, the devil, and the Savior today. That is my plea to you. Don't you let Satan use fear of what others might think. I can promise you, these folks around here, they'll cover you up in kisses and hugs. Amen. Don't you let him take that fear and, set, and keep you in that seat. Don't you let your stinking pride keep you sitting there. Because I'm big and bad. Yeah, you may be big and bad and eternity in hell too. The Bible says this. Jesus Christ himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In other words, except the Jim as Savior. That is my plea to you today. That you don't leave this place without the opportunity to give your life to Christ. The opportunity is here. We will be here, myself, several others will be here to talk to you if you so desire. Let me narrow it down just a little bit. I'm a country guy. That's all I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Nothing more. But I'm here to ask you this. What is it out there in that stinking world that you're chasing so hard that will keep you out of heaven? What is it that you ain't got, that you ain't you man enough, woman enough to stand up to and say, I don't need that? Because it's killing my family. It's destroying my family. It's destroying me physically, mentally, and spiritually. It's ruining my kids. And I don't need it. And it's time for me to stand up and be the man that God asked me to be or the woman that God asked me to be, the teenager God asked me to be, or the child that God wants you to be. And to set aside the world. And come to a right 
relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my plea to you today. Simple. The gospel is simple. This is not complicated. You either desire to spend your eternity one way or the other. There are thousands of people that die each day in automobile wrecks. wrecks. Every single day, people die. Wrecks. Every single day, people fall over suddenly from stroke. Every day, people die from something. A fall off a ladder while they're changing a light bulb. You're going to go out and clean the pool. They don't know the light started leaking, so now there's electricity in the pool, and as they reach into that pool, myriad of ways. Rush, Russian space junk, falling from heaven, hits you on the head. But you can know, you can know what your future is. You can know that when you leave your last breath on this earth, your next breath is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can know that with certainty. I don't worry about dying. I'm going to die. Scripture tells me that. It's going to happen one day. I'm going to see that. Die. But I know what happens past that. And I know it with certainty. And that's my plea to you today. That if you don't know Christ is your Lord and Savior today, that today will be the day of salvation for you. That's what the Bible says. It says the day is the day of salvation. That you'll come and receive the free gift of salvation today that He so freely gives to all who accept. He won't force His way into your life. You notice the scripture said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know why He's knocking? He's knocking. And He's waiting on you to open the door. There's no knob on His side. He's waiting on you reach and open that door and allow him into your life so that he can come in and be a part of your life, lead you, guide you, and take you places that you never thought you could be. Church, that's my plea today. It's also my plea today that if you're dealing with something, maybe you're saved, you're dealing with something, and this is quite another matter. I don't want to downplay what I just said. But this altar is open to anyone who wants to come and lay something down at that altar. But the main thing here today is if you don't know Christ your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you would just give us your scriptures, Lord, that we may see clearly. Now, Lord, we don't want to be simple. Lord, we want to be sensible people. We want to be prudent people. We want to do what we know will give us eternal security for all of all of eternity. That salvation that you so freely give, Lord. So that we know that our last breath on this earth, our next breath is in heaven with you. And been all of eternity there, a perfect place, designed just for us. Designed for you. And you allow us to be there. Lord, I know when the crowd decides that there's somebody right now that's dealing with something in their life. And Lord, whatever it is, whoever it is, I ask that you give them the fortitude, you give them the strength, you give them the courage to set aside that pride that Satan tried to hold them in that chair with. And then, Lord, you set aside the fear, they're worried about what others might think or some kind of thing. Or they set aside the fear that maybe they've had the world convinced that they're saved, but they know they're not. And now is the time to get it right. Lord, I pray for them that you would give them the strength that they need this morning to do what they know they need to do. Lord, I lift all of them up to you. And Lord, that you would deal with their hearts right in this moment. In the sweet, precious, and holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, I ask. Amen.